Welcome to our Resilience and Strength 2021 series, Supporting the Mental Well-Being of the Black Community. I'm Lynn Sherman, Director of Community Engagement and Social Responsibility with Baptist Health. Today we continue our three-part series focusing on the mental well-being of Black adults, parents, and caregivers. This series exemplifies Baptist Health's commitment to improving health and well being across multicultural communities. Each of our sessions include a Baptist Health clinician, a faith leader, and caregiver or individual with lived experience. This session is about providing a reliable and accurate information and in, in, inspiration to help. Black adults, parents, and caregivers manage their mental well being through the COVID 19 pandem pandemic. Our moderator this evening is Selena Webster Bass. Selena is founder and CEO of the Voices Institute, a health education research and consulting group focused on eliminating health disparities, promoting minority health in children, youth, and families. She also trains in advancing health equity in communities, organizations, and systems. Selena Webster Bass holds a master's in public health, is a Jacksonville native with more than 20 years of experience in health equity, community health, and cultural linguistic competence. She's a nationally recognized health equity advocate. Webster Bass has held leadership roles with several Jacksonville-based institutions, including the University of Florida uh, Health Jacksonville, where she was community medicine director for the Pediatric and Family Medicine Residency Program, Shans Jacksonville, Nemours Children's Clinic, where she served as manager of the Pediatric Sickle Cell Clinic and the Jacksonville System of Care Initiative, where she also led mental health literacy, multicultural engagement, and cultural competencies. Ladies and gentlemen, I turn the microphone over to Selena Webster Bass. Selena. Thank you so much, Lynn, and to Baptist Health, thank you for this opportunity to moderate uh, this session on such an important topic, cultivating resilience and strength in the Black community, particularly during this time of COVID-19 and the pandemic. And so, you know, there's a saying that there is no health without mental health. And mental health is an essential part of our overall well being, our life satisfaction, and happiness. And according to the Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health, Black adults in the US are more likely than white adults to report persistent symptoms of emotional distress sadness and hopelessness. And so we have our panel of experts here that we'll hear from uh, Ms. Kanoya Smith, Ms. Snyder, and Bishop uh, Matthews. And I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce each of our esteemed panelists. I'll start with uh, Mrs. Smith. Mrs. Smith is originally from Savannah, Georgia, and she and her husband recently relocated to Jacksonville, Florida after her husband served 20 years and retired from the United States Marine Corps. Ms. Smith has an array of experience dedicating with over 10 years in the mental health field. Her experience includes a mobile crisis worker, supervisor at a crisis detox facility, outpatient clinician with several community health agencies, a medicaid medication assisted treatment coordinator, and now her present position as a care coordinator, discharge planner with Baptist Medical Center Jacksonville at the Riverfront Adult Behavioral Inpatient Unit. Ms. Smith is also a member, as you can see with her blue and white, of the Zeta Phi Beta Sorority uh, Incorporated in St. Augustine. Ms. Smith believes that change occurs when patients are given the proper guidance they need to capitalize on their own strengths to live a positive life. 
Ms. Smith helps to provide an environment of compassion and support to help patients and their families overcome obstacles to live a pleasant life. Ms. Smith holds an associate in, in psychology, a bachelor of arts in sociology, followed by a master's degree in social work. And she is currently a registered clinical social worker intern. Please welcome with me, Ms. Smith from Baptist Health. Our second panelist is Ms. Snyder, a mental health advocate. Uh, Ms. Snyder was born and raised in Jacksonville, Florida. She is a mother of two beautiful children and Whitney lives with major depressive disorder, also known as MDD, and is a mental health advocate. As a spokesperson with the National Association of Mental Illness, she inspires others who struggle with their mental health. And her key messages are that it's okay to not be okay and recovery is possible. Thank you for joining us, Ms. Snyder. And our final panelist is Bishop Designate Bruce Matthews of the Philippians Community Church, Clay County. Pastor Matthews is a native of Jacksonville, Florida, and he was born here uh, as a servant leader and has served the community since his teenage years. He has been dedicated to ministry since the age of 17. He was ordained as an elder under the leadership of Bishop C.D. Kinsey. He later joined with the late Apostle R.J. Washington of the Titus Harvest Dome Spectrum, and they were both called to street ministry, where they prayed for and ministered to countless individuals. Together, they completed biblical studies through the Mason Bible College of Memphis, Tennessee. Pastor Matthews then transitioned to Philippian Community Church of Jacksonville, Florida in 1992, where he served as a staff counselor. He completed courses in the Philippian Institute of Biblical Studies under the leadership of Dr. Lawrence Charles Callahan, Sr. He currently leads the Philippian Community Church of Clay County in Orange Park, Florida. And in addition to pastoring, he is the founder and overseer of Hedges and High Highways Outreach Ministries, which focuses on the prison ministry and the needs of our youth in the community and surrounding areas, which has been in operation for over 20 years. He is married to Elder First Lady Lorreen, and they have a beautiful family of one daughter and three sons. Welcome, Bishop Matthews. We're so glad, so glad to have you all. Welcome to our panel. All right, Ms. Smith, we'll start with you. We know that um, we are all living through this pandemic and we are experiencing the compounding effects of COVID-19 as well as racial stress and trauma. And so what are some of the common mental health disorders that you're seeing in your practice at Baptist Health? And what are some of the treatment options in terms of addressing um, the mental health issues and challenges that, that patients are facing during this time and specifically black adults and parents and caregivers? Okay. So Selena, what I'm seeing um, currently as far as mental health is anxiety, but number one is depression. And so number one, depression is for several reasons. In regards to uh, the black community, we have depression based on poverty. We have depression based on racism. So there's a lot of uh, contributing factors in regards to why depression is at the forefront. And me being on the behavioral unit, we see tons of that daily. Now, some of the things that we can do to kind of help uh, as far as treatment options is obviously therapy, um, medication management, also support groups along with that um, peer, peer supports. So I know Whitney can probably attest to having a great peer support to kind of help us deal with those mental health issues. Um, I would also say engaging in community. Um, support where you can lean on uh, perhaps Bishop Matthews um, as a support. So all those things can help contribute to um, making it better, bringing awareness and being able to deal with the rise of mental health. Thank you so much, Ms. Smith, for um, 
sharing with us the array of forms of treatment there are. You know, a lot of people think that, you know, it's only medication uh, and not realizing that there's also therapy, there are peer support um, options, and also reliance on faith and spirituality. That's an important part, particularly of the Black identity um, as well. Um, but in spite of all of these options, many people are still limited in their ability to access mental health and behavioral health services. So what are some of those barriers uh, to Black adults uh, seeking and utilizing mental health services? And how do we eliminate these barriers? So one of the main barriers in regards to that is the number one, lack of health insurance. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times there's definitely a need for us to have health insurance. So there's no health insurance not only that, if you're paying out of pocket, the cost is extremely high mm -hmm. for those services. So we have to deal with that. Not only do we deal with those barriers, we deal with the cultural stigma of mental health. Mm -hmm. In regards to the mental stigma, a lot of times in our communities, culturally, we hear that, oh, you have a mental health disorder. Well, you're just being weak. Or you can just lay down, take a nap, and get over it. So we hear that a lot. And I hear that a lot on the unit. People are being told to kind of get over it. So really that culture stigma is also um, what we hear a lot of. I'll say too, for the black community specifically, there's a lack of health care providers. There's a lack of psychiatrists that are African-American. There's a lack of therapists. And I think a lot of people in our community will, will view that as possibly a lack of cultural competence and the providers that they do go to. And I'll say also that one of another a key issue that I've noticed a lot, uh, just being on the behavioral unit when people are coming in for help is that they have no awareness of being able to navigate. It's difficulty navigating um, a therapist. Uh, sometimes looking for a therapist is really like looking for a job because you wanna be able to connect and find one. I see you nodding your head, Whitney. <laughs> <laughs> And, and so ideally, because you literally have to, um, to get the help that you need, you want to make sure that you're pairing yourself with someone who's competent. And so again, looking for a therapist, it could literally be like looking for a job. So that navigating can make things difficult. Um, I'll say in regards to that, one way that we can really help in our community is educating ourselves. So if we educate ourselves, we can be better advocates to our people in, in our communities. Um, is it each one teach one, I believe. So we learn one, we teach the others. That way we can advocate better. And not only that, locating um, resources. And there are several resources that are community health resources. So the cost would be low. They do uh, a, a sliding ski field and some are even free because they're state funded. So being able to uh, find those re resources and being able to kind of link up with um, and advocating is a good thing to do. So Ms. Smith, you've given us a lot of information in terms of how we can eliminate these barriers to mental health services. One, you've mentioned that there's a systems issue in terms of access to services. I believe the number is about 13% of the population of the black population that does not have health insurance. And so that's one barrier. Um, culturally responsive care is another, another barrier. Absolutely. And so what advice do you have to um, Black adults in terms of finding culturally responsive providers, providers that understand one's cultural context, understands where they're coming from in terms of their faith, their spirituality, and also in terms of um, uh, dealing with issues of discrimination and dealing with issues of, of racism? So what advice do you have in terms of trying to identify a provider that's culturally responsive? So what I will say is there are quite a bit of resources. So mm -hmm. the first thing is always research, research, research. For instance, there are some resources that are Therapy for Black Girls. And what Therapy for Black Girls does, it's an online space that encourages the mental wellness of Black women and girls. Um, it's a referral tool that you can kind of find and locate in your surrounding area. Um, also, there is what they call Enopsych. Enopsych's mission is to bring healing to communicate, um, to healing to communities of color by changing the face and the feel of therapy. 
there's also the uh, Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation. And that agency uh, kind of focuses on changing the perception of mental illness in the African-American communities. So there's a lot of different resources that we can locate there where therefore we can kind of find more people who we may align with or feel more confident in speaking with. Awesome. Thank you for sharing those links and resources. Those are, are great tools that I'm sure our participants will take advantage of. So thank you for that. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat box, Ms. Smith, and I'd like to direct one of those questions to you. It says, do you find that many African-Americans try to self-medicate by using cannabis or a substance to help them cope? Absolutely. I just had this same exact conversation with a coworker. I wonder if that's my coworker. <laughs> But ideally, in the African uh, in the African American community, instead of seeking out a therapist or a psychiatrist due to the cost, we turn to marijuana. For let's say people will say they use marijuana for anxiety and depression, but what we don't know is marijuana use can cause anxiety and depression. Mm. And so, a lot of times, again, it goes back to educating ourselves on what the mental illness is. Because um, when we educate ourselves, we know more about what's going on and we can better advocate. Not only uh, marijuana use, but I'll say the big one is alcohol use. Mm. And that's not only in the African-American community, that's all the way around. So a lot of times when individuals are dealing with depression and they're dealing with anxiety, they say, hey, I can go get some Hennessy and it's probably $20 for a bottle versus going to spend a hundred or more on seeking therapy. So that that is a, a big deal. And that happens a lot. Yes. And so it's so important that we cultivate positive, you know, coping strategies versus those negative coping strategies. And you've offered us uh, several examples of that. One of the other topics I really want to address because this is real during COVID-19, where we have, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that have died, this issue of grief and loss. And so um, the Washington Post conducted a, a poll and they found that one in three Black Americans know someone personally who has died um, due to COVID-19. And we know the death rate among Black uh, individuals is up 10 times higher than among white individuals. So we're, we're experiencing the compounding effects of grief and loss, uh, not only from COVID-19, but also in terms of the loss of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Chadwick Boseman and so many others, Representative John Lewis, major icons in our community. And so how do we deal with the grief? How do we deal with the communal pain that many people are, Black adults are experiencing and, and maybe don't have that gracious space to actually you know, process, process that and talk about the pain of grief. Can you give us some strategies and, and coping um, approaches in terms of addressing grief and loss in the Black community? So one of the things I will um, definitely say is engaging in mindfulness. Self-care is so important. A lot of times we don't take that time for ourselves when there's so, so many things going on. And a lot of times people don't know how to deal with grief and loss. So they, they try to stay busy. But what they forget to do is pay attention to your body, pay attention to what's going on mentally. So engaging in mindfulness uh, activities that you enjoy doing helps. But not only that, I'll say that involving yourself in support groups Mm -hmm. A lot of people really don't kind of go there and say, hey, I don't want to really talk to anybody about things. You don't have to go to a therapist. You don't even have to go to a doctor. What you can do is lean on support groups to kind of help with the grief and loss. Mm -hmm. Lean on family, lean on community support, such as going to the church, leaning on mental health advocates such as Whitney. So being able to, <laughs> definitely Whitney, being able to kind of, <laughs> mindfulness and engaging in community resources as far as support is how we would deal with, and I would say dealing with grief and loss. Thank you so much, Ms. Smith. And this is our final question before we move to Whitney, but I'm sure Whitney can probably relate to this question. We don't want to forget about our parents and caregivers because, you know, many of us are working from home and also managing children at home if they are, you know, participating in virtual school. 
And so what advice do you have uh, in terms of managing the stress now of being a parent and caregiver of children that um, are affected by remote learning and many of their activities are being disrupted as well, such as graduations and proms and, you know, they're, they're you know, things that are important to them in yeah. terms of building uh, peer relationships and, um, you know, their own adolescent cultural identity. So what advice do you have to parents and caregivers who are also navigating um, their own stress around caring for children? I think what, what we can do is kind of be aware, awareness of symptoms, awareness if you see your child kind of closing off and, and closing down because there is, I guess we're on punishment due to COVID right now. So it's kind of difficult for them to get out. However, there are some things that we can do, really spending time um, with our family members and our kids, taking them out to a park that's not crowded. But again, more importantly, just really being aware of those symptoms that they are um, demonstrating. And a lot of times we, we don't really pay attention, but I have a nine-year-old and, and Lord knows, I know when Jameer is like, okay, I'm bored. I wanna get out and see the world now. <laughs> so we gotta keep them active in our own way and get creative, get creative with some things. Thank you so much, Ms. Smith. So we're going to transition over to you, Ms. Snyder. Uh, we'd love to hear more about your own personal journey in living with major depressive disorder. Um, can you tell us about what that's like? Um, you know, how did you know? What, what type of signs and symptoms did you experience um, leading up to your diagnosis? Yes. Yeah, so um, first, thank you for this opportunity. And um, I actually just got diagnosed maybe a little less than a year ago. So, but I've been living with depression and anxiety since I, you know, I would say since about 12. That's my first memory of it. Um, but it's just been a blessing to finally have a diagnosis so I can know what medications I needed to take and, and you know, knowing like what my triggers are because of it, because each um, mental health disorder or illness is different. Depression, it's like an umbrella. There is, you know, depression and anxiety. And some people can have depression and not have anxiety or, or they can have a mixture of both and they can both be triggered by different things. But for me, I, I'm blessed to have um, a African-American therapist and an African-American um, psychologist. And so both of them together have helped me and they diagnosed me after being in the hospital um, or being hospitalized around last year in July um, during an episode. And it's just been, it's been nice to know, okay, when you're starting to feel this way, this is what you need to do. Um, so I would say my, my episodes, can be extreme or mild. They will start off, maybe I'll notice I'm kind of losing interest in working or losing interest in just daily tasks. And then I'll notice sometimes maybe I don't feel like showering or I, I can only muster up enough strength to you know feed my kids and like make sure they're in bed, but I don't have the energy to feed myself or the motivation even to want to eat. And so um, it usually, it can last from two weeks up to a month. Um, but now knowing again, my triggers, how, you know, when it, I feel it coming on, um, I put in some practices, some self-care as uh, Ms. Smith mentioned, self-care is very important. Um, I'll notice sometimes maybe if it's coming on, I'll be real irritable, like snappy for like for no reason. And when I notice that and being self-aware, again, like she said, a lot of great things you said, Mrs. Smith, um, being self-aware, I, you know, a light goes off and I'll say, I need to do this. I need to take a step back. You know, I need to, instead of a shower tonight, I need to take a bath. Once I get the kids to bed, I need to set aside some time for myself. Also, um, medication, I am on medication for my mental health. And um, that was a big struggle for me because, you know, again, stigma, mm -hmm. us in the African-American community, medication, like we don't do that. We're going to pray about it. And like she said, get over it or, you know, 
try to find a way to cope. But for years, I would say at least 10 years, I was coping without medication and without therapy also. And it was extremely difficult. And so if I could leave anything with you guys, if you're feeling off, it's okay. There's, it's, it's okay if you're not feeling well. It's okay to talk about it. If people in your family are saying, oh, well, you know, we don't deal with that. Even after having a baby, they're like, oh, that's just baby blues. But I had depression before that. But I didn't listen to the people that were trying to make me feel like, oh, you know, it'll get better or whatever. I had to for myself and for my children because what happens is in the Black community, we suppress it. We try to pray it away. We try to keep keep on keeping on. And then when those levels of serotonin, you know, get to a, such a level to where they're so low, anything, something so small as just you losing your job could send you over the edge. And that's why when people say, well, she was coming to work. She was smiling. She was happy. She was coming to church. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, a tragedy happens. And it's because there was little things along the way that didn't get addressed. It didn't get treated because of, of stigma, excuse me. So thank you, Ms. Snyder, for just your authenticity and, and just sharing with us about your personal journey. It takes a lot of courage to, to be vocal about living with a mental health challenge. And that's part of the reason why we're having this conversation is because we want to eliminate the stigma associated right. with, with mental illness. So what advice do you have to someone who is afraid of therapy or afraid of taking medications related to their mental health condition? What would you say to um, an individual who's struggling with that? Um, I would say that fear and, um, you know, being afraid of it, that's a natural reaction, right? Of course, when we are not used to something, it's natural for us to be afraid of it. But what can it hurt, I would say. Um, it's if, if you are feeling uncertain about it, give it a trial. You know, you have to, like with therapy and with medication, you have to see which one works best for you. But it's better to try it and it could really like drastically change your life. Um, what I didn't understand, because a lot of people like myself, too, uh, but in the Black community, we think depression has to do with your life, your circumstances, and that in some cases it does, but for me, everything in my life can be going great. It's beautiful outside, but it's like on the inside, I have a cold and I still don't feel, feel well. Even though the sun is shining, everything is going well, and so medication, when it comes to it, it comes in to help that chemical imbalance. My, my depression is truly when hormone levels get out of whack or whatever the case. And, and so that's what the medication is for. It's not just because I don't, you know, I'm not happy about my life or whatever mm -hmm, that case mm -hmm. is. And therapy helps. And even with the struggles right now around racism and, you know, the trauma, okay, because that's another thing that what's going on in the world right now is traumatic for us in, in, in our community. And to keep seeing that over and over, self-care is also knowing when to unplug, to turn off the news. I haven't, honestly, I haven't watched the news in months, you know, and, and if it's something I need to know, I'll ask my mom or whoever, but it's important for me because that's triggering for me when someone else, you know, is, is, is murder. So, um, but therapy, it, it helps to talk and get those things out. It's so therapeutic just to be able to talk to someone and say, this is how I'm feeling about that situation. Um, so I would, my advice, just try it. Therapy, what could it hurt, you know? And um, like she said, finding a therapist is like finding a job. You, I've went through three therapists before I found one and I've been seeing her for over a year now. So, um, so yes. 
you've shared so many nuggets with us in terms of being self-aware, knowing your triggers, doing your research to find culturally responsive providers. So thank you so much, um, Ms. Snyder, for sharing your, your personal passage with us. Both of you have mentioned the role of the faith community, and we know that the church, faith institutions have been a lifeline for Black communities for centuries, a place of refuge, a place of hope, a place of comfort, and a place of dignity for, for Black communities. And so, um, Bishop Matthews, tell us about the role of the faith community in supporting the mental well-being of Black adults, parents, and caregivers, and how do we balance theology with, with religion and spirituality? How do we find that balance? How do we integrate the two. And you're on mute. It's okay. Uh, the first thing is to get off of mute. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and then thank you, sister. Uh, I mean, Thomas, sister, I'm in church. That's fine. Uh, Alina, <laughs> God bless you and all the, the participants and the panelists this evening. Um, wow, it, it's been a lot said. And um, for the faith community, it's important that we support everything that's going on. You'll be surprised how much the Bible talks about even uh, mental health and the things that were going on. Um, and just for an example, uh, I looked at 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. And um, in that, Paul was talking to the church at Thessalonica. And he mentioned this, and this will... Um, a little bit and say, he says now uh, that 14th verse, now we exalt you, brethren, warn, warn them that are unruly, comfort, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Wow, Paul said this. And then in looking up the definition for feeble-minded, that's people with mental issues or, or, or weaknesses and, and, and things that are going through the struggles. Wow. Our mentality or mental, everyone has a mentality or mental. Uh, um, and so we have such as a stigma, we call it different words in the black community and, 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 and we demonize it to the point that, you know, you crazy, something's wrong with you, you, you know, uh, and then you, and and when the Bible expresses this, it said, "Be patient, supporting." Wait a minute! It doesn't deny it. It says it's there. Paul recognized it. There were people in this position. So down through the ages, this has been the mentality of human beings. This is everyone has anxieties, worries, or something you go through which affects your mental health. Just like being sick, physical health, mental health. You can get sick, seeing brought both or all, okay? So according to the Bible, and, 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 and so I want to state that this is important that we deal with this and that the church be the forerunners for helping people to get through this. Some people come to church for peace, for their mental health. They come to church for therapy. They come to church to hear songs that soothe them and, and to get them in another place and get out of this place and get in another place uh, to help. So church is like a hospital for everybody, no matter what you're going through, so church is there, but then when we take church and make it something what we want it to be rather than what God intended, then that's the problem. So down through the ages, hallelujah, uh, it's, it's, it's a, I, I mean to preach, I'm sorry, but uh, it, <laughs> it's okay. it has to be dealt with and we need, thank God for Lynn Sherman Baptist Health. You, you need medication. You need understanding, so you need therapy, but you need to know that there's another side to this. There's a spiritual side and there's a physical side. And you have to deal with the whole man, all mm -hmm. of it. And when we come together, we deal with all of it. We deal with the whole thing. You can't, 
take one part and leave the other part off. Understanding it, I heard someone say, I think um, Smith, understanding it, getting a grip on it, getting educated about it, helps us to move toward solutions, help us to move toward, toward deliverances, help us to get what we need in the community. Uh, I, I'm, I don't know if that's my time. <laughs> I don't want no, to you've know. you've you've hit all of the key points in terms of us thinking holistically about mental well-being. That yes, we should be aware that we must educate ourselves. Yes, we know about medications, we know about treatment, but there's also the supportive role of the church as well, and the encouraging role, the songs, the you know having that place to go uh, when you need to be encouraged. So so thank you for emphasizing the important role of the church in terms of supporting mental well being. So Bishop Matthews, you know, with COVID-19, many um, churches and faith institutions have had to adapt their services because of public health precautions. So how has your ministry continued to meet the spiritual needs of Black adults in spite of COVID-19? Well, what we are doing now, we're doing what we're doing today, Zoom. <laughs> Zoom is a good um, engine or a uh, place to be continue in um, services. Now, everyone, and I have multiple com conversations concerning people that I'm not comfortable with not being around people. I want people around. Me. So there are some that I need to go to the building. I need to be in the building. I need to see the people. I need to, and so their need is the bodies there. Oh, different one says, you know, and some say, Zoom, oh, great. I don't have to go out. I don't have to spend gas. I don't have to dress up. I don't have to do this and that. So I'm happy with Zoom. So you got different people have different ways of thinking about this thing. And when we are, because of our situation, we were in a, uh, a senior citizens, you know, institution in, in their chapel. So when COVID came in, everything was shut down because these are the seniors and we couldn't go back in there. So, and even till now we're on Zoom and Zoom has been a blessing to us. It, it has allowed us to expand our ministry beyond the borders of even Florida. We're in other states, uh, we, we, others have joined and uh, we have also, we're not just dealing I know this is about adults, but we 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 open up even even uh children's kids corner ministry to deal with them. They have to go through the COVID too. They have to learn too. They have to be challenged too and learn about the Lord and and, and as as well as the, as well as the adults. And they are so happy to get together together on Zoom kids corner. So this is a time for them to get their outlet. So as well as adults. We have Bible study, and 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 I want to tell those that are real spiritual, real spiritual, real spiritual. The anointing is still there. Presence is still there. He's omnipresent, so he's there. You're getting what you need when two or three gather together, even on Zoom. He's right in the midst, so you're not missing anything. And souls are still being saved right on. Souls are coming to the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm watching God. This is, this is powerful. Oh, so the need is there. The solution is there. And when we follow what we get, we, we get results. And we are getting results. And I thank God for that. Amen. That's awesome, Bishop Matthews, that your church is standing in the gap during this critical time. So what's next in terms of COVID-19? We know that people are getting vaccinated. Um, so what are your plans six, 12 months from now in terms of church and worship and how you will continue to support your, um, your congregants? Well, some things are happening. We're still looking for a place to be because we are, um, wanting to gather back together with the people that, that have the need to come to a building, have the need to be in the congregation. And, and, and I don't see any reason why not when things get better and things come together that we can continue that, but we don't want to leave this that we discovered. So both 
uh, coming together. That'll be my, my work is bringing both Zoom members and our physical members together in the local communities and as well as supporting the local communities. My One thing this is brought to mind to myself is that not just having a building filled with pews, but having a ministry to minister to the community. If I had a building, I would want it to be used every day of the week, not just on Sunday. Mm -hmm. A place that we can bring food in, like the food is being carried and be a place to advocate or to give. A place for those that are homeless can come out the cold. My mindset now, you know, we were trying to fill up a building, trying to get as many people in and, and, and grow the church and, and get them in there. It's more now the community needs us. I believe all of this happened and a good thing came out of it. We can go to the community like we should, go into the world, go out and compel them to come. It forced us to go and be where the people are, even the more. So that's been a blessing. Yeah. Bishop Matthews, uh, earlier we mentioned racial stress and trauma, uh, the issues around George Floyd and uh, several of the deaths related to law enforcement. And so the Black church has a tradition of addressing civil rights and human suffering. And so have your sermons um, centered on the topic of racial unrest, have you found the need to address that in your in your ministering with your congregants? In particular, um, what the Lord gave me concerning that is the same thing he's already done. And it's a scripture that tells us, Lord, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, and thy strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. And, and this is fulfillment of the whole law. Jesus had a teaching that we should even pray for our enemies, pray for those that despitefully use you, pray for them. So that has not changed even uh, with the skin color. It has not changed because of that. So that's a, a thing you deal with it. You don't act like it's not happening. But if there's ministries and people that see these things going on and not saying anything, that's a uh, detriment, you know? Why be quiet? You, we are allowed when it's something else, but then when it comes to racial unrest, we get quiet, you know, don't want to say anything and be quiet about it. And 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 that's, that's not good that, um, can't talk like I want it, I don't think, you yes. know, but, uh, <laughs> we get what you're saying. It's a transformation of the heart. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and it's something that has to happen. But um, the Bible says, don't render evil for evil. Mm -hmm. you, you're done wrong, so you want to do wrong. That's not right. And that's not um, God. And that's not what we should be doing. But we shouldn't uh, be silent and say it's not happening. It's happening. It needs to change. Uh, uh, black men, you know, are... are having issues with, what if, what if I run a stop sign? What if I do this? What if, you see me, what, my hair is long. I, it's not, I don't look like everybody else. My pants hanging off. I'm our target. Will I live today? The police stop me. I'm not gonna walk away from this. That's a real fear that young black people are having today. What's gonna happen to me? And, and, and the lights go on and you're watching TV and boom, boom, boom. That's a fear. Yes, absolutely. And it's a real endangerment and what should I do? Mm -hmm. And it's it's crazy that black men have to teach their black son, uh, keep your hands in sight, uh, don't ask too many questions and be polite. And are uh, the others, telling their children the same thing, or just us. Right. And, and these are issues that are happening and we can't be blind to it and it's going on. It has to be addressed. Absolutely. But not in violence, not in killings, not in, you know, no. Okay. 
Thank you so much, Bishop Matthews. And this is our final question for all of our panelists. You know, our theme is resilience and strength. And so what are your final words in terms of cultivating resilience and strength in Black adults during this time of the pandemic and racial unrest? And so I'll give each of you about 30 seconds to share your final words. Ms. Smith, we'll start with you. made sure I had to take it off mute. Well, I'm definitely going to say educating ourselves. Educating mm -hmm. ourselves is at the forefront. You have to educate yourself and know what you're up against uh, in regards to mental health. You have to educate yourself to be aware and know what resources you have. You have to educate yourself so that you can advocate for yourself. So education is definitely key. I love that. Educate so that you can advocate. Love that. Thank you. Ms. Snyder? Um, I would say, um, I would say, um, as far as strength and resilience, um, find what works for you, whether it's medication, therapy, um, support groups, but finding what works for you. Um, being resilient and persistent with what works for you um, is is what will help, and and it's okay. Like I said, not to be okay, but finding what works for you, finding the light in your struggles, will help you along the way. Well said, Miss Snyder. Thank you. And then Bishop Matthews will end with you. You'll culminate our session today, resilience and strength. How do we cultivate it in, in Black adults and uh, parents and caregivers? Um, one way we, um, resilience and strength is supporting one another, mm -hmm. uh, looking after one another's needs, caring about another more than yourself. Um, and we are, we are the strength of one another. We need one another. And, and then our love for one another and our concern for one another takes us farther than we can ever go. Unity is strength when we unify uh, and, and come together and then under the, the auspice and under the, the umbrella of God's love and care, the strength of God, the holiness of God, everything that comes from the Lord, our very existence is in him. In him we live, we move, we have our being. And he commanded us to share it with one another. So when you're down, I'm going to encourage you. If I'm down, I need you to encourage me. I need you to say I can make it. As I tell you, you can make it. I can tell you, you'll be all right. You can tell me I'm going to be all right because of him. And the Bible says that if any two shall agree as touching anything on earth, it shall be done of our Father which is in heaven. So when we agree together as one, Hallelujah, we can do anything, accomplish anything according to his will. And uh, so we thank you so much, hallelujah, for all that you've done and, and Ms. Selena and, and Ms. Lynn Sherman. And then I want to do this one thing. We have an organization that I'm part of called AIM High. AIM High is African-American Mental Health Initiative, which is uh, headed by Sister Ann Marlowe, Ms. Ann Marlowe. And it is a powerful um, engine in the community whereby we have seminars and, uh, uh, and, and, and we come together and talk about what's going on, talk about what's happening. We address it with professionals such as today. And it's awesome. People walk away with feeling better and having some answers and going forward in their life living. So uh, we thank God, my hat's off to aim high, praise God. And to all of you in Baptist Health, my God, you're doing a great job in the community as you host and, and have these talks about mental health, amen. Thank you again to all three of our panelists. I have enjoyed my time with you today. You all have educated us, you've inspired us, and we will educate ourselves, we will advocate for ourselves, we'll find wor what works best for each of us, and we will remember that we are inextricably tied as one community, that we are connected. And so uh, we'll put up our, our final slides of a few resources.
Um, first of all, let us announce we this is a three part series. We have one upcoming session left. And this one is on our children, our babies, supporting the, the mental well-being of our Black children, teens, and young adults. And so we encourage you to register. Uh, that one is scheduled for June 22nd. 5.30 to 6.45. It's a little longer because we have four panelists instead of uh, three. So please join us for that session and go to Eventbrite and register. Next slide. We also want to remind you that the National Association of Mental Illness has a local chapter right here in our city in Jacksonville in Northeast Florida. And so we encourage you to connect uh, with NAMI uh, for support groups. Ms. Smith, um, Ms. Snyder, as well as Bishop mentioned the importance of us connecting with other people, connecting with people who have similar lived experiences. And so here's a resource right here in our community that we can uh, take advantage of. And so they meet the second and fourth Tuesdays of each month uh, at the Baptist Health One Call building. And so visit their website site, namijacks.org for more information. Again, thank you for uh, joining our Resilience and Strength series. And I'll turn it over to Lynn Sherman for final comments on behalf of Baptist Health. And on behalf of Voices Institute, it's been my pleasure to be your moderator for this session. Thank you. Thank you, Selena. Hello again, everyone. On behalf of Baptist Health, I would just simply like to thank our moderator, Selena Webster-Bass, and our panelists, Courtney Ross, Whitney Snyder, and Bishop Designate Bruce A. Matthews for an informative and thought-provoking discussion tonight on supporting the mental well-being of adults in the Black community. We look forward to seeing everyone as Selena mentioned at our June 22nd event where we will focus on the mental well-being of our black children. We want to thank you and thank you again and thank you. I can't thank you enough for being here because as they've already said, the more we learn and the more we educate ourselves, the better off we are as a people, as a community, and the better we can help and support one another. So I want to thank all of you for being here tonight because it, it certainly does uh, demonstrate your willingness to learn and your willingness to be able to serve others in our community. So we want to, again, I want to say thank you and good night. <laughs>